How's it going everyone? Today we're going to be talking about the basics of a GraphQL schema. So what is it exactly? Well really it's just a collection of types with fields that are populated from your backend data stores. So we know that GraphQL is a data querying language for APIs. So defining a schema is really just defining a blueprint in which you have the bunch of types and query mutations that the client can actually make to access data and get it back from your backend data stores. So what are the types that a schema can include? Well, there's scalar types, object types, query, mutation, and input types. So what is a scalar type? Well, similar to primitive types in common programming languages like Java, for instance, Boolean, integer, characters, GraphQL's default scalar types are pretty similar. They're int, float, string, Boolean, and ID, which is a unique identifier. And all these resolve to concrete data all the time. What about object types? Well, object types contain a collection of fields, and these fields can either be scalar types, which we just mentioned, or they can be another object type. So let's take this as an example. You have a type book that you defined. This is an object type, right? And then you define fields for this type. So I defined a field title and author. And I want to define the type, right? So what type is title? Well, it's the string, right? Which is a scalar type. And what type is author? Well, author is actually another object type that we defined here, right? So this is another object type that we have as a type for a field in another object type, right? So in this object type, there's fields name and books, and the name here is a string as well, and the books is actually a list of book, which is another object type that we defined here. What about query type? Well, query types are really just read operations that the client can execute against your data graph. So for instance, right, this is the type query, right? And inside here, you define all the queries that the client side can make, right, to access your data. For instance, get books, right? That's the name of the query, get books. Or in this case, this would be called a field, but really it's a query that you make in the front end, right? And get authors, right? And so this is actually the return type. So I'm saying get books is a query that I can make in the front end or the client can make, and I, it returns a list of book, which is an object type that I defined. Similarly here, get authors return a list of object type, which I defined, which is author. And uh, so let, take this scenario for instance. Let's say I had a screen that I wanted to display all the books and all the authors on the same screen. So as mentioned in the last video, in REST, you would have to make requests to two different endpoints, for instance, API slash books, API slash authors, and then you would display the data. In GraphQL, you can just make that in one request. So you define query, and then you define the query that you want to make, the query that you defined in your schema. So I define get books, right? I also define get authors. Well, wh what was the return type for get books? Well, it was actually a list of books, right? And so you can actually specify the field of book, the field inside of book that you want to get back. Well, I only want the title back of the book. Well, okay, I can specify that. And I only want the name of the author back, and I specify that. So the data that I actually get back is, for get books, I get a list of book objects, and I specify I only want the title field of the book, which I get back. Similarly here, I also get, in the same request, I get a list of authors with only their name, because that's what I specified. So what if you wanted to get all the books with title and author name? So think about it. We have these types that we defined, right? So we have type book, and we have these fields for type book, and type author. We have these fields type author, and we define two queries. So how, what, how would you write a query and get back all the books and only the title and the author name? So pause the video and think about that for a second. All right, so this is the answer. You would write a query and call get books, which is a query that we defined in our schema, and you would specify the return type. So like I said, we only want the title of the book back, right? And we want the name of the author. Well, we know that get books actually returns a list of books. And we know that book, right, actually has fields title and author, right? And author actually has fields name and books. So I can specify that I actually want the title back, and I actually want the author back. But I don't want both of these fields from the author back. I only want name. So that's what I specify, and that's exactly what I get back. A list of books, right, with the field's title and the name of the author. So what about mutations? 
Mutations are really just write operations, right? So similar to queries, right, you would define type mutation, and then you would put the name of the mutation, and then the return type. But in this case, in this example, I gave you arguments, right? So you can also have this in queries as well. You can have arguments as a, as in, inside your queries as well. So an argument, really, you just specify the name of the parameter, right? And the type, right? So later when you call this, you would mention the actual name of the parameter and you would specify the actual value and that value has to conform to this data type that you defined in your schema. Let's take an example. So let's say I want to actually call this in the front end or in the client. I would call mutation to specify that it's actually a mutation, right? And I would actually call the name, which is add book and the whole signature. And so the parameter is actually title and author. And I would pass in the value. So this is actually a string. And this is a string, right? And that's exactly what I defined. So there would be no issues. And I would specify the return type, right? Which is title and uh, an author and only their name, though. So for mutations, you can specify whatever return type you want, right? It could be a Boolean. It could be an ID. You can even use it just for caching or just checking that the status went through. OK, so this is the response you would get, right? You would call add book and you would get what you specified, which is the title and the name of the author. And obviously, by creating this request, you would have actually added the book, right? But remember, GraphQL does not actually concern itself with how, you know, how the implementation, implementation done is done. It's actually just a querying language that allows you to easily relay the data between your client side and your, your um, back end. So what about input types? Well, input type is really just a special object type that allows you to pass objects as arguments. So instead of passing in scalar types, so these are all scalar types, right? As arguments, I'm passing in a scalar type string, string, a list of string, right? Instead of making all of these parameters, I can just pass in one object that actually represents all these scalar types. So this really keeps operation signatures clean. So take an example. This is how we would use an input type for the previous example. I would define a type mutation and I would define the name, right? Create post. And instead of actually having three arguments here, I only have one argument. And what is that actually? What is this type? Oh, well, it's an input type that I just defined here. And the fields are actually exactly the same as what I had earlier. So the last thing I want to talk about is field nullability. <laughs> so what exactly does that mean? Well, in previous examples, we saw that the types, right, they would have fields and they would have um, scalar types or object types, right? You would define what type it is. But we never saw this exclamation mark. What exactly is that? Well, all that says, right, it says that this type, it cannot be null. Under no circumstances can this be null. If this is null, it will throw an exception, right? If there is no exclamation mark, this is saying that, you know, it could be null. There would be no issue, right? Right, so expect it that it could be null, no exception would be thrown. So let's look at this example, right? This is saying that, okay, it's a list of episode object, which is probably an object type that we defined, and it's saying that, well, this whole list cannot be null. And it's saying that the elements in the list, or the objects, right, the episode objects, also cannot be null, right? So that's all this exclamation mark see, it means. So if you see it, just you now you understand what it means. All right, thanks for watching, guys, and make sure to stay tuned and like and subscribe.